Welcome to Digi Tales, a podcast hosted by me, Andy Williams. We'll be exploring how the rise of digital video platforms is changing film and television. And in this upcoming episode, I speak to Dan Belinka, a multi-BAFTA winning writer and director who I've been lucky to call a close friend for many years. Dan has had a successful career as a writer for children's TV, but recently has helped to shape the groundbreaking online mystery drama Dixie and the new coming-of-age series The A-List. I'll be asking him about his experience on Dixie and his thoughts on how new platforms are shaking things up. So, first of all, hi Dan. Hi Andy. <laughs> um, thanks for agreeing to do this chat. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for um, asking me. And as a special token of thanks, uh, I've got you a bribe. Oh, brilliant. A nice bottle of wine. Excellent. I'm going to look at it. So, I'm going to rustle it near the, uh, near the uh, microphone. Well, that looks lovely. That will go with a nice steak and I look forward to having that. Thank you very much. A couple of things I wanted to cover off was um, your experience um, producing, head writing and directing Dixie. Yeah. Um, And then the other stuff I'd Uh like to kind of maybe um, pop a few questions in is your professional background. We may even touch on wrestling at some point. Excellent. No, very Um, happy to... uh answer anything I can as best I can great so before we dive into the questions about Dixie could you just give us a bit of background on your career and your sort of professional background my career such as it is yes Um, uh, it's an interesting one because um, I've done like talks in schools and things like that where people um, they ask you know what qualifications do you need and 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 my career path is so odd it's just such a mixture of of odd you know bits of luck and coincidence that you couldn't um replicate it so anyway but this is my story so um i uh where to begin it um i went to and um after university i did a po- i did postgrad at nyu uh, um and when you study at an american university you get a um a work permit for a year to work in your field afterwards um and uh, i wanted to work in film but i had some experience in television because they had their own on campus tv station and I got an entry-level job in what was advertised in the New York Times as um, a sports entertainment company, which turned out to be the World Wrestling Federation. Um, and this was a, a life-changing event because um, it was a small uh, television facility that made wrestling programs uh, the, for the World Wrestling Federation, now World Wrestling Entertainment. Um, but it was brilliant because um, you got to do a bit of everything. Uh, so I started as a production assistant, which is a lot like a runner. You know, I would um, bring drinks, uh, get food orders and so on. But because they were short staffed, within two weeks, I was overseeing edits. Um, soon I'd be producing voiceovers. Um, I learned how to do, you know, basic tape to tape editing because um, if we needed, um, you know, highlights packages, we would just cut those our, ourselves. Um, uh, I'd do location stuff. I'd be involved in um, and you know in floor managing in huge multi-camera shoots so I was there for about two and a half three years something like that I can't even remember it felt certainly like because you worked all the time um, but they were literally the, the most professional brilliantly hard-working people I've ever I've ever <laughs> worked with um, and I learned a huge amount from them uh, came back to the UK um, was looking for work um, knew one person in British television um, and eventually uh, wound up at, uh, at Sky in a department called Original Program Development, but basically they made interstitials. That was it. I got hired to do uh, an interstitial series. So I was traveling around the country doing box pop interviews with people, which was sort of, you know, within the skill set I would have learned from the wrestling because I used to do a lot of box pops interviews with, um, with wrestling fans. Um, had my own wrestling TV show for a bit, um, uh, and again, you know, one of those bits of pure luck. Um, uh, somebody uh, at Disney was looking for a development producer, and somebody that I'd been at sixth form with knew her and recommended me, and I got that job. So that's how I moved into children's television, um, made uh, a little animated series there, and eventually moved to the Disney. Uh, promo department which is where I met you which is where we met yeah yeah just going back Mm. on the wrestling thing um, did that time teach you anything specific about character development and storytelling and kind of the intersection of that with an audience yes I think so I mean um, they would talk about storytelling a lot 
um, they would talk about character a lot. One of the things I loved about wrestling is one of the great compliments you can pay a wrestler is to say he or she has great psychology. And what they mean by that is their ability to move an audience. Um, uh, you you can you see it play out live. Uh, when I was at my own wrestling company, it's it's very satisfying to see an audience react in real time to a story that you've uh, that you've um, written. Um, but the other thing is also it's responsive. So uh, there'll be better places to hear the story uh, than from me. But uh, the rise of the Rock is a great example. Was brought in to be this um, clean cut baby face, Rocky Maya Via. Um, the fans were supposed to love him, and the fans felt the inauthenticity of what they were being asked to love, so they would chant Rocky sucks at him every time he came out. Um, so they almost had no choice but to turn him, to turn him heel, um, and uh, he joined the Nation of Domination, I think, um, <laughs> and somewhere along the line he became The Rock. And once he was now this uh, this um, this heel character, um, now the fans loved him, and, and eventually became The Rock that we all uh, know and love today. As I say, the, I'm sure there are better um, retellings of that story. But that somebody I remember saying to me, um, uh, and I can't remember who, I wish I could, um, but about you know the joy of, of wrestling, the theatre of wrestling, was, oh, I think it was um, the seminal match at WrestleMania 13, Bret the Hitman Hart versus uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, the I Quit match. Um, but uh, it's, it's an absolute brilliant match because at the start of the match, uh, Bret is the babyface, Stone Cold is the heel, and by the end of the match, which Brett wins, they're booing Brett and they're cheering Stone Cold. Um, and somebody said, they said, you know, if they if the audience, um, if they cheer when you want them to cheer and they boo when you want them to boo, you know, you know that it's working. So that is something that has absolutely sort of carried over as a philosophy um, into what I do. And that sort of the bit of the story I, I didn't complete was, so blah, 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 I ended up at Disney. And then as a producer, you're often writing and somewhere along the line, I managed to um, to drift into actually writing scripts uh, full time. So I did less producing uh, increasingly and, and more and more just writing. That's great. And what's interesting, so, you, so you've had a, you've a very successful career as a as a writer mm. for, for, for TV <laughs> yeah. and film, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's one of those. That's something where you develop a script and you're working with quite a close knit team in terms mm. of crafting that script, and then you you film it and then it gets mm. um, introduced to an audience. But there's quite a a gap between kind of when you get to see how that script lands with an audience oh, gotcha. to when you're developing it. And what's interesting with your example on the wrestling is that that sounded like it was quite kinetic and immediate yeah. in terms of the audience reaction. And moving on to your experience with Dixie, mm. I wondered whether when that kind of interactive, it's available mm. online and it's, and it's got more of a... A kind of communication and a back and forth with an audience. Did was any of the your experience with the wrestling and and that kind of engagement with the live audience? Do you feel like that um, fed into the development for Dixie or the way that Dixie evolved, or did it feel quite separate? No, well, I think you know not in a, not in a conscious way, but just you know everything you do is a is a is an influence on everything you do subsequently. And when uh, when Dixie came along as a as a project, it was sort of. Um, uh, to quote Travis Bickle, my whole life has been leading to this because every aspect of that show was using something that I felt I had experience of um, somewhere else. So just to explain what Dixie was, um, it uh, so it began life as um, a TV proposition um, and it was going to be, uh, they were calling it a whodunit set in the world of social networking. So whereby um, a girl who really loved her social media profile finds that it's been hacked and goes around, um, basically investigates her, um, trying to find out who, who hacked her, her, her profile. And um, the BBC liked it, but they didn't like it at a half hour. And this is all before I'm involved. So, um, yeah, so when I got involved, um, they knew they wanted to do it on the web. And uh, so I very grandly said, yes, I know how to do this. Um, my own kids were not watching uh, regular TV anymore. They were just watching YouTube vloggers. So. I thought we'll do the episodes not as a traditional drama, we'll do it um, in the form of first person vlog, so we'll make it look as if it has been shot by the by the main character, um, yep. the girl, Shari, um, and we'll house it within this kind of uh, um, 
uh, illusion of a, of a social network or of this uh, fictional social network. Um, so you would, we would have a news feed and sort of the clever bit was, um, so the vlogs would appear within that. So it was very much the experience was a lot like, you know, looking at Facebook or something like that. You could scroll through it, but then all the characters would post things and some of that would be videos, but it would be photos, but just little comments, a lot of it quite inconsequential. Yeah. And then the audience could add uh, comments, which are moderated because it's uh, for kids, but there was this, this big comments section. And then uh, I and... Um, and the, and the and the team, uh, Nina Mativier, um, who was one of the writers and script editors on it and producer, um, we would pluck out the the best comments. And by best, what I mean is not necessarily the best written, but the best that in terms of serving the story. Yep. And we never explained to the audience how we were going to do it or what we were going to do. It was almost just being like picked as the star letter. So we'd put that into the news feed and then the characters would reply to that. And the, and the amazing thing about it was, as I say, without any real instruction to the audience, there was no how to do this. Yep. Um, there was no how to do this page. The audience instinctively understood, oh, we're role playing this. So we will talk to the characters as if, um, as if they're real. Yep. Um, and we will have a, a friendship with the characters. Um, and yeah, and it just grew exponentially. Um, and um, you know the the original trilogy, which had the same characters in in, in three adventures, we did three series with them. Um, you know, first series, I think it had something like three thousand comments, which at the time was a big deal. Yep. By the time of the last series, um, of series three rather, um, it had you know sixteen thousand comments. Amazing. I mean, you barely could keep up because people just loved talking to these characters and the fact that the characters talked back to them was amazing. And the other thing in terms of your question about um, how responsive one could be. So a lot of times when, uh, um, you know, uh, would explain to people that it was an interactive show, people assumed that it would be like um, like Bandersnatch, right? Yeah. It would be a kind of choose your own adventure, but it wasn't at all um, because we'd already shot it, you know, and yeah. we'd written it, we'd shot it. Um, we couldn't change how it turned out. The interactivity was, as I say, in that relationship with the characters, and we could give the illusion of... Um, uh, of you affecting the story. So, for example, if somebody, because it was this who done it, so if somebody said, I think you should investigate Zane, well, if we knew that Shari didn't investigate Zane for another 10 episodes, we'd have her say, no, it couldn't possibly be Zane, uh, I'm going to do this bit of the investigation. But if we knew that in the next episode that is what she's yeah. doing, then she'd go, oh, that's a brilliant idea, yes, I will, you know what I mean? It was, um, and, and I don't think anybody was sort of. Uh, bothered by that it was the it was the emotional connection to the character that is what um so it was another layer that connected. effectively allowed the audience to almost kind of participate within the story but the story and the plot was already defined yes it was a, a bit like you know if you're watching something like um you know when people were watching breaking bad and yeah. uh, or whether they're watching game of thrones whatever you always see um oh, this latest fan theory in a way it just encouraged fan theories but with the added bonus that it would be, you know, so if you had your Breaking Bad theory, you'd have Walt reply to you and say, no, I'm, you know, <laughs> no, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> murder Hank or I will murder Hank or whatever, you know, there would be, it would be that. Great. Though one of my questions I had here was that you hadn't directed for a broadcaster before Dixie, is that correct? Well, Apart that's... from the, maybe the wrestling stuff and the promo stuff? It depends what you uh, what you mean. I mean, the short answer is I hadn't directed uh, drama before. Right. So, so my question was, uh, how was it being the head writer of a show and the director as well? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing ever. Um, so, yes. So, I had directing experience in as much as, yeah, I shot a lot of wrestling promos. I've, I've directed wrestling matches. Um, and uh, with you, obviously, um, yeah. with, I've done um, I directed puppets yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and stuff like that. Directed a lot of voiceover. But I hadn't done a drama and um, originally uh, Melanie Stokes said uh, I think you should direct it and I went no no I think you should you know, get somebody more experienced um, but then she said it again and I think it might have been a budget thing because it was cheaper to have me do it but uh, I sort of took the attitude well this is something I've always wanted to do and if, if, if the universe is asking you twice you know do it and they surrounded me with really really brilliant experienced people so um it's like a band you know you can go a long way if you've got a great um rhythm section um uh and so i had a brilliant director of photography alan wright who does you know very high-end 
um, shows um, and a uh, brilliant first AD uh, called Will Dutton and a brilliant sound recordist uh, Nick Walker who does again um, actually does lots of high-end documentaries which was perfect for Dixie because we were really skeletal I mean that was that was basically the crew. I mean, the, the camera department was Alan and 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 one camera assistant. You know, and for sound, and sound was one person was Nick. Right. You know, he did it. He did it all. He's he's literally he's he's his own boom swinger and he's mixing it at the same time. Yeah. You know, um, so incredible that um, skeletal crew that enabled us to you know shoot on moving buses in in tiny tight um, spaces. Um, and in a way, the 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 story lent itself to that because it was. First person, exactly, um, exactly. Vlog. In in Dixie, I mean, basically, and this is one of the reasons why we moved so fast, and we were finishing early to start with. And I would start writing new sketches because the you know the producers were like, well, we we have everybody here, you know, shoot something. Yeah. So we'd be shooting music videos or whatever. Um, but it was because unlike a normal thing, you know, there's no coverage. I remember the editor, a brilliant editor, um, on the on the first series and on the subsequent series, but uh, she did she did the first one, and she'd done you know amazing shows like Sugar Rush or whatever and uh, the footage was coming over and she phoned me and she said um, yeah yeah I'm getting this stuff through but just where's the coverage and I was like there isn't any because <laughs> the whole conceit of the show is that um, that Shari you know is either on her webcam or on her phone but either way it's one fixed camera angle you know she's, yeah. she ain't shooting reverse shots uh, for a couple of episodes I would cheat and I would have two people shooting so that I could and for the finale I'd always have three people shooting so that I could get some coverage because yeah. I would need it but for the most part a whole episode might be Shari sits down at her computer, turns on her webcam, and then just talks, and it, it breaks every rule of drama, right? It's like, you know, people always say, show, don't tell. But I'll, I, I remember when we were doing the first series, I said, we just have to hold our nerve, we just have to hold our nerve, because our show is basically just a girl telling you what's happened, yeah. you know, because we... So we were telling more than we were showing. And we did... Um, uh, we did, obviously, try and find ways of bringing the camera into situations, but we always had that... Um, uh, that fundamental device, which meant that um, it was quite theatrical. But I mean, I, I, I loved though it, it was very, very European art house. I would have one wide shot, and then I would play out an entire three minute episode in that one wide yeah, shot. Yeah, it's great. Um, with no, with no cut. So one of my favourite episodes that the whole thing is uh, it's three minutes, and it's Shari played by Claudia Jesse, who's a very, very brilliant actor, and uh, um, she's been since then. She's been in Line of Duty. She was in uh, Vanity Fair. Um, and we're going to see him in, in lots of things anyway she's an uh, absolutely terrific actor um, who could hold your attention um, and I mean all the cast are brilliant and, uh, and it's just a three minute episode and she's just uh, talking to camera on a bus which is driving round Hackney and every, everybody else um, that comes and interacts with her, it's like a little mini play and people had to hit their marks and, and hit their cues and, they, and they're going up and down the steps on this moving bus and coming to sit next to her and do their little bit of the seat. And I'm watching it because I, I, by this point I'm like, um, I, want to, I want to get it all in one take. I don't want to do any pickups. I mean, uh, the start of it allowed for jump cuts, but there was an energy you would get if yep. you um, did it in one. Anyway, kind of long story short, we did. It was incredibly exciting. And what was lovely for the actors was like once we got it we got it you know it was, it was done you know so you didn't have to then do it again and for the reverse and for this and then we'll just do a mid and we'll just do a little pop here there's none of that what, if we did it we did it and what's great about that is that even though the way you describe it it was um, it was quite a small crew and quite yeah. a tight crew that's that's throws up a lot of challenges for a director because you're having to really get the best out of the actors and the team to to hit the marks and you don't have a lot of the safety of being able to cut away to lots of yeah. different angles and and I think that's one of the things that I think you're particularly brilliant at is I think you're really good at getting great performances out of people. Well, I've been very lucky to work with just these um, so there's always been young casts that I've worked with um, but just you know just really really uh, good actors and the and the original um, uh, you know the Dixie cast. So I mean Claudia, I mentioned uh, April Hughes, who um, has gone on to uh, she's in a lot of West End shows um, and uh, the, most recently the the Harry Potter one. Uh, again, just just brilliant uh, actor um, Jordan Lochran, uh, Kerry Boyne, who's now um, I think a host on uh, CITV. Jordan Lochran's done loads of stuff. She was in uh, Emerald City. Um, Beth and Wright, uh, um, 
the, all of our actors, uh, Beth and Wright was in the lodge. Um, they all went on to to do um, big uh, big things. And then when we did a reboot cast, um, we had uh, uh, you know that was a cast that included um, Rebecca Hansen, who uh, you're going to see lots of, and Molly Sue, um, uh, and uh, just uh, who's um, nominated. I just saw on Twitter she's nominated for a Fangoria Award, which is t- terrific. No, <laughs> so I've been very lucky. I've worked with really brilliant actors, and I love working with actors it's such a privilege and uh, and I think what I give in return is because I like working with actors so much um, uh, and act- actors actors like a bit of attention and they like to know yeah. that somebody is you know caring about yeah. their performance which I do very much so it's very it's very intensely collaborative in a in a hope in a good way great and I think it commented it as a head writer I think that brings a different perspective if you're the director as well because because there's an understanding of the material and a kind of a sense of what is right for that character. The, so I think there's, um, the, you, bring, you bring that dimension to it as well. Well, the good thing about being across the writing is um, I, uh, I always knew where we were emotionally in the story. So we're shooting out of sequence, but I could, um, I could say, um, you know, you're coming from here that we haven't shot yet and you're going there that we shot two weeks ago or whatever. Yeah. But, I, but I would know where we were in the in the emotional um, journey. For sure. Great. Um, were there any surprises in terms of the audience that the show reached? Um, so taking my own kids as an example, mm. um, tr- the traditional categories of children's, family or adult TV don't seem to apply in the same way when they watch stuff on Netflix or Amazon, when those kind of boundaries get a little bit more blurred. Is that, did you find that you had a different type of audience for Dixie? online than you might have expected to have had if it had been on CBBC or something like that? Well, um, it was interesting because then eventually, I think after we'd done series two and we were doing series three, um, we packaged up series one and two. Um, we compiled the three minute episodes into 11 minute episodes with some graphics. So it did go out on, on CBBC. And I think there the audience skewed ever so slightly younger. Um, and it's a very girl skewed show, but on TV, it. Um, I remember a comment like, "I love Dixie, and I'm a boy." <laughs> um, but it, so it was a girl skewed show, but on TV, um, it reached more boys than you might have uh, than you might have thought. What was lovely online, it was very much. It was like the kids' own show, so it only reached uh, kids because um, you know you could only find it through the CBBC yeah. um, website. Um, but it was theirs. So there was no sort of. Um, there was no, there was no presenter. There was no continuity presenter. It was just their show. It was just them and the characters. And in series three, we did a, we did a same sex romance um, uh, between this very popular character Eve um, and Eve dated a girl, and um, we just did it. And uh, the audience, what was really interesting in their reaction was that some of the kids, as they started commenting, so the girl that. Eve goes on a date with it's called Addie um, and some of the kids um, start going oh is Addie a boy I thought Addie was a was a girl you know they just assumed you know they yep. just sort of made it heteronormative and then other kids in the comments would reply to those comments this is as I said this was no intervention from us whatsoever this is kids talking to kids um, would reply like no Eve's a girl Addie's a girl girls can date each other um, so that was just lovely to see how um, without us doing like a big issue we didn't it, oh and it wasn't an issue storyline even though our show was um, about cyberbullying yep. um, always you know that was the, the common theme but it um, we sort of also at the same time created a sort of a fantasy world which was despite all of this bullying um, there was sort of no no racism no sexism uh, no homophobia what well, the things that people were bullied about was kind of was kind of more just um, whether you were a loser whether you were cool or yep. not you know um, and so so I say it wasn't done as an issue storyline it was just done but basically the thinking was um, representation, um, but also um, we ask our audience to invest emotionally in our heterosexual romances all the time. Let's ask them to invest in uh, in a gay uh, romance, um, and and they did, and they and it was and it was lovely. And as I say, it was there was no there was no point to it other than that we thought it was right for the character and right from a representation point of view. Great. Um... Another question following on from that was that, um, oh sorry I do yeah. I do have a, I, I'd want to ask yeah. something else about surprise but there was um, one lovely surprise was when the 
um, author and uh, and playwright and and cultural critic uh, Kim Newman. Um, somebody uh, alerted me to the fact that he had posted about how much he liked the show uh, on Facebook because they were a Facebook friend of his. So I quickly went to check his Twitter, um, and uh, he yes, he did these lovely tweets recommending Dixie, and uh, actually made it one of his pick of the months in uh, in Empire magazine. And then by pure chance, I was at an event. Um, and he was there, and he's very recognisable, uh, and I got to meet him, and I was reading his book at the time. It was just such a weird coincidence. I was reading his book, Anno Dracula, um, and, uh, and we became friends off the back of, uh, of meeting in person. But that was a lovely surprise with somebody, because there's somebody, you know, Kim is one of the... You know, if you're doing a documentary on horror, you will have Kim as one of your talking heads because he's absolutely an authority on that. And I'm, so I'm a big, that's great. I'm and a big horror fan, so um, so that was a surprising viewer of our show. And actually, that's something that I hadn't had as one of the questions I wanted to ask you. But um, do you think he kind of responded to? Were there kind of any connections to kind of that genre of of mystery and yes, and I, horror that kind of were were there within Dixie that kind of he responded to? I think it was, um, I think A, it, it, Kim is just somebody who watches everything and has a really, really open mind. Um, and I think he loved the the energy and performances of the of the young actors. I think he bought into the way it was uh, sort of stylistically different because it's kind of like a found footage yeah. format. Um, and yes, and it's, it's very, very genre playful. So series one was, um, uh, I guess a sort of an Agatha Christie type who'd done it mapped onto uh, a school setting. Series two was absolutely teen horror. They went off on some field trip. There was like they were, you know, it was literal cabin in the woods stuff. So we were playing with teen horror tropes. Series three, they were in a kind of performing arts academy. So it was kind of like, hey kids, let's put on a show type of thing. So yes, I'm sure the genre playfulness was um, was part of it. And, and and series four, we were doing a sort of. Um, political thriller undercurrents as well um, which is something I, I love one of my favourite films of sort of relatively recent times, it's not that recent anymore um, but it was certainly an influence on Dixie was um, Brick, did, did you yeah, ever see yeah. that? Yeah, so to map the kind of sort of um, uh, sort of film noir tropes onto an American high school um, I love that, I love that kind of um, mixing of genres but then to just play it, um, not as a big pastiche but to play it like you mean it yeah. um, and that's what we did with Dixie as well it's like um, for all our genres playfulness it's like to our characters it, it, you know the, the friendships busting up was genuinely the end of the world kind yeah, of thing. yeah the, the, absolutely. the emotional impact so yeah so I I um, I, I, I love that I, you know I, um, I, I like uh, genre and I like um, being playful with um, with the tropes that you get in that stuff that's incredible the when before we um, started the interview we yeah. were talking about um brilliant creative director that we'd both worked with a guy called David Snyder oh, yes. uh, at Disney and he had a way of asking a question about for this specific to animation mm. series which was what is the animation imperative what's the thing that only animation can do that we're taking right. full advantage of do you think is there for drama or storytelling that's on kind of VOD platforms or streaming platforms or online is there is there a kind of an imperative behind that that's something that only those that it's only those stories that can be told there, or do you think we're still in some ways evolving to try and find out what that is? I think we are. I mean, so, so Bandersnatch was really interesting. Yeah. Technologically, it's absolutely brilliant. So I watched it on my TV via my PlayStation, because um, that's sort of the best interface I've yeah. got, but it was just, um, there's no buffering. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's incredibly, Seamless. So that's something I guess that you can only do yep. um, where, where the technology is really being used. But um, was it? Was it? Um, did you think it was as satisfying as it could be from a narrative point of view? Because sometimes my my kind of feeling, because I was a, I read a lot of those choose your own adventures, right. and um, and there was an element where there was maybe an ending that was the best ending, but that they had to kind of provide two or three alternatives to kind of fit within that format. Uh, yes, and I mean, like I say, I think Bandersnatch is an amazing achievement, but just on a sort of personal note, I probably, 
um, I probably prefer sort of unified endings and that might just be me being old fashioned but I kind of want to see the same thing that everybody else saw yep. so you know um, with immersive theatre for example I'm the kind of person who would be afraid that I went left instead of right and didn't see the amazing thing I want to I want to see the same thing I don't you to go oh did you see that amazing bit and have me go no I didn't I, I didn't see that I went up the stairs you know so um, but, that, but don't get me wrong I mean lots of people really really do love uh, um, love that um, I'm trying to think or like in video games I remember playing um, it's one of the Silent Hill games I think it's Silent Hill uh, Homecoming uh, uh, it really doesn't matter which one it is but anyway the point is I, I completed the game but I got one of the bad endings and I read everything but I, I did everything right and I did this and I did that and it was like there's literally one thing I did at the end where I hadn't realised I was supposed to do something got me the wake up screaming in the asylum ending I'm like oh come on man it's like <laughs> I did everything right whereas I tell you what I think is brilliant from that kind of um, storytelling yeah. is um, Telltale's uh, first I think it's their first Walking Dead game so from a gameplay point of view um, it's not the slickest game in the world right. but the character designs are great and the um, uh, the characterization is great the lead character is brilliant um, there's a little girl that he's protecting called Clementine great character um, and all the way through you're making choices yep um, and my kids still uh, do this uh, you know it's like so if you um, argue with somebody whatever it will say I can't remember the name of the character but it will say Pete will remember this you know so I'll uh, you know be talking to my son and he'll just go Mason will remember this <laughs> um, so it's great so basically the goal is that by the time you get to the final bit of the story yep. depending on how well you've balanced all these other characters that you've been interacting with um, it's how many of them will come with you on the final mission. So right. if you've if you've done well, yep. they all come with you, and and they they did all come with me. I I I've been very diplomatic, <laughs> and uh, I'd, I'd kept the team together. But you might end up with no one coming with you because you've alienated them all. Yeah. But because I played it, and all my kids played it. Um, the story basically there are fundamental things that happen no matter what so right. for me that's almost like a perfect synthesis of yes you have your own version of that story but I don't want to do but spoiler there's a collective people. shared experience yes yeah, so we could all say play. oh but did you but did this happen yes that did happen that's you know, interesting certain key things uh, they're almost like you know fixed points in time they have to happen uh, so that's probably my favourite iteration of that uh, of that type of idea like the last show that I watched sort of exclusively in a kind of once a week um, I think I still had a TiVo box so I think I was TiVoing it but I was still watching it you know on television yep. rather than on demand um, was The Wire and that was uh, and I got into it relatively late um, FX re-ran or they were launching season five and they re-ran um, the first four seasons in the yep. run and I watched those once a week you know, as God intended, yeah. um, uh, and then watch season five, and uh, and then I can be one of those people who goes on about how it's the greatest series ever because it's yeah, the greatest series I ever. I think you very well, uh, maybe. Um, but uh, now Breaking Bad was something that I started watching on uh, FX, I think yep. it was, and again in that kind of once a week format. Um, but whichever season it was, there came a point where basically uh, it, 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 became, it moved to Netflix. I can't remember yeah, yeah. when that was. But anyway, that was the show that made me get Netflix. Yep. You know, um, But I'm still, so Better Call Saul, I think they dropped the episodes once a, once a week, I yeah, think. Yeah, they did. Um, so... And there's an, an element where kind of Netflix and those um, disruptor kind of VOD platforms are actually moving to a space where they're they kind of they are they have the appearance of more traditional TV where they'll have they'll you know they'll drop them to a schedule they won't kind of release them as a box set yeah so so one series of Better Call Saul I definitely was like I was hungry I was like oh new Saul um, but season four I think it just took me quite a long time to get round to starting it so certainly by the time I was getting to the final episode it was it, to me it was a box set yeah but I'm but I'm not a big binge watcher you know and I, I I fall asleep so. So for me, I mean, it's it's just um, the absolute wonderful, you know, golden time of just being able to to watch things. Um, I was telling you before we began this, you know, my new favourite show is a French show called Call My Agent. I think there are already three seasons of it. I, I hadn't heard of it until last week. Um, a, a random tweet by somebody that I respect made me think, oh, I'll have a look at that. It's French, great. It's about actors and agents, brilliant. And it's it's just the, the best show I love it it's sort of um, tonally it's kind of like it's the, I haven't enjoyed a show that much since maybe like um, sort of early six feet under do you know what I mean that, right. you 
remember when it was yeah. sort of like really stylish but witty and great characters it, it's it's that anyway, it's it's brilliant i can't i can't praise it enough um but yeah but it hasn't really what what has it changed i suppose it's it, it's just given me more choice and control and knowing that it'll be there you know so i don't have that oh uh, i mean i am the kind of person so back in the um, back in the in the 90s um, my favorite show um, well, my two favorite shows were Roseanne and uh, Dream On and I think they were round about that. I think they were both went out on a Friday night on Channel 4 right um, and I loved those shows so much that I wouldn't go out um, but I would tape them even while I was watching them in case something happened that would disrupt my viewing because I didn't <laughs> want to miss right. a second of the show like what if the phone rang yeah, or yeah. something like that and you know um, uh, you know what if somebody came to the door so uh, obviously so for me it's just this wonderful golden age now where you know you can have what you want um, when you want um, in terms of uh, and I think you know obviously I work a lot for younger audiences um they seem to really like the box set thing because they will just watch all of it. So I recently did a show called uh, The A-List and that was um, sort of experimentally put out with no channel attached to it. Yep. It's, a, it's a teen show. Um, for uh, the BBC. For the BBC. And it, so it came via CBBC, but it, um, but it was put out on iPlayer. But it's not made by iPlayer either. So, there's, so it's, just, it's just there. Yep. And... Um, and it's just interesting. We, we, I think we're still learning. And that um, felt like it fitted in the category of a kind of stranger, a stranger things type of. Yes, but um, it's weird. Like the characters were older, but in terms of age rating, because I think in, in Stranger Stranger Things is obviously quite violent. Yep. Um, and uh, and it has sort of fifteen rated uh, language. Ours uh, our show the A list was more. Um, uh, sort of aiming for the sort of uh, thirteen to sixteen. But it would be probably PG rated at at at, at most. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, again, I think it's that that audience has been incredibly underserved um, because everybody knows that they're just going off and watching things that they're not meant to be watching. Yeah. Um, so the A list was an attempt to make something specifically for that age group, but it's it's very early days. So the first series just went out, and uh, I you know I think people liked it, but you don't. You know, you don't. Uh, there's something. If you're not on telly, you don't have ratings in yeah. the same way. Well, so, I loved yeah. it, and well, I think it's a, I thought it was an amazing mm. achievement. Yeah. A well, we're, we're all very, very proud of it. And again, I mean, talking about the young actors, the um, um, Lisa Ambalavana and uh, and Ellie Duckles, but um, with the, with the two uh, lead women. Um, but I mean, every single actor in that show uh, is, is is an amazing talent, and that we're going to see. Um, a, a lot more of, um, and they, they they were absolutely brilliant, and their and their commitment to to the characters they were playing was was terrific. Fantastic. Okay, um, I my plan is to end a lot of these interviews with mm. a series of quick fire question and answers. I'll do my best. Are you happy to for me to fire away? Yeah. Okay. So first existential question mm. is: What's your idea of happiness? <laughs> 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 I have so many answers to that. Um, I always say that I am the the happiest man in Athens because I am the happiness. But Socrates was the wisdom. Uh, I am the happiest man in Athens because I don't aspire to being happy. I think trying to be happy just makes you miserable. Um, but my idea of happiness is um, is a vodka martini and um, and a Duke Ellington album. Amazing. Or, you know, a classic movie. I mean, it's a really hard question. Well, that that, that sounded pretty good, though. Okay. Um, what are you scared of? Uh, everything. Um, driving over bridges, spiders. Uh, not so much death, but dying. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, now, a yeah. piece of work, yeah. film, program, music, yeah. that you wish you'd made. Oh, God. Um... I mean, it is kind of almost like everything. Uh, what I would really like, I would love to have done something um, that had like the cultural impact of, say, um, the Twilight Zone. Yeah. You know, um, that, uh, and oh, yeah, I would love to have come up with Stranger Things because that is so much in in the in the area that uh, that that I that I love and and it's a show that I really enjoyed. I suppose, I suppose yeah. So there are other shows like The Wire. I love The Wire, but I wouldn't want to have made The Wire because I don't have that kind of um, uh, sort of political uh, insight, yep. and, and it looks like there'll be a lot of research, and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not into that. So um, uh, yeah, Twilight Zone, 
or um, or just any number of the the horror films that I that I grew up on. Great. Um, so, the related question. Oh, Killing Eve of recent things. I thought Killing Eve was a fantastic, fun, playful show with great performances, brilliantly shot, great dialogue. Who wouldn't want to have made that? I would have loved to have made that. Great. I'm not saying I could have, I'm just saying I, I thought it was brilliant. Which talent would you like to have? That I don't have? Well, yes. sorry, that was very presumptuous because <laughs> I have so many. Um, uh, I wish I could sing. Um, I, I I can't, um, and, or I wish I could draw. Um, uh, uh, I wish I was musical. I love jazz, and I wish I was one of those people who could just effortlessly just sit down. Yeah, and, and I'd love I'd love to be able to play the piano. I, <laughs> I took piano lessons for far too many years as a kid, and I think at the end of it, my piano teacher, when he was told he was being released mm-hmm. from the burden of teaching me, skipped down the drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I I couldn't play a note even after three years, but I wish I could sit down at the piano yeah. and just play something. Um, if you could come back as another person or thing, what would it be? Um, if it was a thing, I think like a like a dog, like a well treated dog. That looks like a good life, you know. Just being happy all the time, and just people feed you, and then you spend the rest of the time sleeping. I think that would be brilliant. Or a duck. I always like ducks because you can walk, you can swim, you can fly. There's a, there's a, in terms of a person. Um, me just with more with, <laughs> with more um, with more material benefits. <laughs> um, a favourite word. Oh, uh, I don't. I think I have a favourite word. I have, um, I have overused words. I say broadly a lot. I've noticed recently. I'm broadly in favour. I, I say that. A lot. I don't think I have um, a favourite word. Um, least favourite food. Um, it, it's. Oh, um, anything with raisins and sultanas and 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 like Christmas cake, stuff like that. Yep. Um, if you had a motto, mm-hmm. what would it be? Oh well, um, I do have one. And it's, <laughs> uh, it's it's um, it's pinned above my uh, desk uh, from the Samuel Johnson Museum, which is well worth a visit if you've never been. And it's a quote from Dr. Johnson: uh, "No man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money." Brilliant. Um, the period of life which had the biggest influence on you as a person um, of my own life. Yes. So like my, my formative years. Yes. Um, Probably my forties, which is sort of still now. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I don't know. It's sort of like so. I, um, uh, I had you know a childhood that was partially well, uh, you know, partially in the seventies. Um, so funny, somebody on Twitter was asking like, "What's the most nineteen seventy six nineteen seventy six thing you can think of?" And that was a very easy one to answer because it was like that <coughs> that long hot drought of 76 I was living in Suffolk at the time yeah and so I must have been um, you know I was, I was little so and it was the summer holidays and when you're little right the sun is the six weeks or whatever it's yeah. forever and it was just hot and sunny and and that was brilliant and Shawadi Wadi were I think I don't know if they were at number one but certainly you couldn't go anywhere without hearing Shawadi Wadi under the moon of love so that I suppose again uh, even though Stranger Things is more 80s but it's capturing that sort of same it was such a sim- yeah it was such a simple time the 70s you know just like yeah. three channels and you know see people got into CB radio I mean, it's <laughs> crazy um, and then the 80s um, one of my favourite films is uh um, Radio On. Have you yeah, ever, have I you haven't seen, seen Radio On. Uh, so do you know the plot of Radio On? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Basically, a, a guy drives to Bristol. Yeah. That's it. That is it. Um, the music. A guy drives to Bristol, listening to David Bowie and um, and Kraftwerk. Um, and it's. I think it's nineteen seventy nine. I think it actually comes out just before um, the the Thatcher years. But it is. It's. It's the London that I... So we moved back to London, I think, in 1980. I was born in London, but we lived yeah. elsewhere, and then we moved back. Um, but it's the London that I remember. This was slightly... The film's black and white, and it's beautiful. Um, but, uh, and I think, it's, I think it's Vin Vendor's crew that he's, that he's using. Um, but anyway, it's just... It's just grim and depressing and bleh, um, and, and and what everybody uh, is harking back to at the <laughs> at the moment. Um, but somehow that sort of slightly depressing, um, uh, yeah, sort of late seventies, eighties England. Um, I suppose that those years are always going to going to form you because there comes a moment you go from being the person who's like into music or whatever, yeah. um, and uh, and then suddenly there you're walking in going, who's this? Who now? Yeah, yeah. I never heard of him, you know. Yeah. Um, and that and that happens. Um, and then we get sort of um, 
stuck and I just go back to listening to my jazz records. Great. Um, so this isn't very quick fire, is it? It's brilliant. <laughs> it's great. Um, so civilization yeah. is burning down and you can save one piece of music, okay. one book and one film from the fire. Ooh. Um, what would your choices be? That's a really... Uh, so for music... Um, I mean, it's impossible, isn't it? Because you... Um, so I'll just pick something. So I'll take Mahler's first symphony. I'll do yep. that. Ooh, or Duke Ellington, take the A train. I'm not sure. So one of... The, I'm sorry. Okay. That, that's two. Um, book, I guess it's got to be Complete Works of Shakespeare. Yeah. Um, I think it kind of has to be. Um, if we're doing runners... Oh, if somebody else has saved Shakespeare, then I might save all, <laughs> uh, all of Jane Austen. I don't know. Okay. I like Jane Austen. Um uh, it's still it's a big responsibility. It so, is because I'm trying to plan for rebuilding <laughs> civilization. So I'm trying to think what would help. And for a movie, it's really tough, isn't it? It's like um, uh, I'm going to say maybe Buster Keaton's The General, just because you you you've got to pick something. It's very tempting that I would want to pick a Bogart movie because I love uh, Bogart so much. Um, but I kind of think if like if you're trying to rebuild all of cinema, then Buster Keaton's The General is probably not a bad place to start. Fantastic. Okay, well, that feels like a really good place to wrap up. Thank you. Um, thanks for taking part in this. Bye, everyone. Oh, bye. <laughs>